Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of CEO and Market Expert Interviews. I'm your host, Lucian. Some of you know me as Triangle Investor from X. I have a lady in my show today, a very well-known lady from the Uranium world. She's a founder of The Next Big Rush, the daily newsletter about mining and exploration. Fabi Lara, thank you for coming to my show. It's your first time here. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Lucian. It's a pleasure to be here, finally. Thank yeah, you. definitely. <laughs> Uh, Fabio, let's start with the overall overall uranium market. Uh, is the stage for the big move in the short term ready? What do you think? Ha, huh, that's a good question. So I've never, I keep saying this, and forgive me for saying this again. Sure. I've never seen a market like uranium, and I've never seen the uranium market as good as it is now. And I've said that many, many times because the story has only gotten better. Okay. I, my biggest concern with the uranium story is that it's difficult to find a good counter argument for the commodity itself doing extremely well in the next, call it five, seven, 10 years. Yeah. Everywhere I look, I try to find the bear case for uranium and I, I can't find anything that's plausible. I can't find anything that's long lasting and something that's really going to move enough pounds in the market mm -hmm. and so when when something is too good to be true you have to kind of take a step back and get even deeper into it to really try to decide whether your portfolio really deserves that much attention and to me the answer is clearly yes because you know we we finally have the the senate in the u.s passing the the russian bill against against uh, Russian uranium coming into the US. And obviously there's always loopholes. There's always ways in, in which that can be worked around to a certain extent. But what we see specifically in the uranium market is that everything that happens happens so slowly that I almost feel like we're cheating because we're looking at what's happening and we're looking at the signals of what is going to take effect in the next six to 12 to 18 months, et cetera. And we can afford to make bets now yeah. on what we know for a fact is going to happen in the future because, you know, of political will, of uh, shortfalls in production and difficulties, for example, with Cameco and Kazatom Prom not being able to massively turn on the spigots and, you know, overproduce. And so I, I don't know what else you could put your money towards that is a better, stronger case than uranium. So yeah, for me, whether you see your portfolio grow in the short term to mid to, to long term, I don't know, yeah. uh, but I think it's inevitable. I couldn't agree more on everything you said over here. Uh, Fabi, how are you looking at the current valuations for Uranian companies? Producers and near-term producers are getting much more love than the explorers and early developers. Do you see that changing maybe? Yes, and I think it would be um, it would go against historical norms for that to remain that way. Obviously, when you look at the producers, so let's let's take a look at the biggest producers, you know, Cameco and Gazatom Prom. They will always get a bid to a certain extent as long as big money is involved. Let's not kid ourselves, you know. Uh, if you have a multi-billion dollar fund, you can't buy, you know, a sub 10 billion market cap yeah. company. It's ridiculous. Like yeah. it just cannot, it cannot happen. And so they will look for liquidity. That is happening also in the gold market. You know, some of the bigger names are getting bid up because it's bigger money coming in. And so the first leg of the bull market that you see is the the biggest names whether they are cheap or not it it's not that it doesn't matter but it kind of doesn't matter because if a fund really wants to get in on a story and that is their only option they know that all the other funds can only get in on that company as well and so they're they're going to bid the price up because at the end of the day it it goes beyond being a valuation thesis of this particular company is cheap because it's more like we want to participate in this theme and this is the only place we can do it. And that's the, 
that's what all the other money managers are going to have to bid up as well. So it comes down to that. When I look at the developers, I still see lots of value. And when I look at like early stage developers to, you know, like explorers, I think there's lots and lots of value. And I think it would be insane for us to expect the explorers to move first and then for, you know, for Cameco and Gazetta Prompt to move last, yeah. because that means that the thesis hasn't caught on. It's more of a, an exploration bull market when that happens. And I don't think we want that. You know, well, what we have realistically is a commodity led bull market. Yeah. Therefore, the producers will get the bid first. And then we know what happens, developers next, and then, you know, explorers last. That's just the nature of it. And trying to fight the market is just futile and you can lose a lot of money by yeah. trying to do that. Yeah, good point. Uh, that said, how is your portfolio structured? What percentages of the exploration companies uh, do you have in your portfolio and how much are the developers and producers or maybe ETFs? So that's that's a good question. It's all over the place. But I don't recommend people do what I do. I have a lot more explorers, um, but I have to structure myself in a different manner because partly is because I sit on the board of a company. And so I have always known that eventually that that was going to be my largest position. Yeah. I think that if you put your name behind something and you have a level of it's not even control, but influence over yeah. the outcome of one company, of then that should be, you know, what you focus on. And that, that company is a uh, rush rare metals. I'm sure you don't mind me uh, sure. mentioning it. Yeah. Definitely. And to me specifically, I don't look at producers. Um, maybe I should, and I do recommend people look at them and I do, you know, tell people it, it's probably a good idea to own them because I think that the, the average person wants to see movement in their portfolio throughout the whole bull market, and they're not patient enough to mm. wait until their specific stock gets bid up. And I'm quite patient in that way. And so whether it's uranium or gold, silver, whatever, I always prefer to have developers, you know, within my portfolio. And I, I always try to make that my biggest position so that that's the answer like across the board developers are always my biggest position um with this particular company there um there's a, a project down in wyoming that we have optioned out to myriad uranium and the reason why i actually joined the company and, and why i was so excited to do it is for the development of it it wasn't for the exploration but for the development of it because in Wyoming, as well as a lot of different places in the USA, because there has been a full bull market start to finish of uranium development back in, you know, from the 50s to almost the 80s, you already have the resources and they're not up to modern standards, but yeah. you kind of know where the deposits are. And you know that they are not super large. They're usually on the smaller side. Uh, they're also usually not super high grade, uh, but they did work at a certain time. And there were many, many smaller mines working throughout, you know, certain regions, Wyoming, Utah, Texas, and, and others. And so when I look at that type of company and that type of project, to me, it's a development story and not an exploration story, even though, you know, you're going to have to go back in there and explore again and bring those resources up to date the fact that we know the uranium is there, we just don't know exactly how much, to me, it is the best way that you can position yourself. And so that for me is always the biggest part of my portfolio. I couldn't give you percentages because it's sure. been, it, it varies all the time. So I don't have it off the top of my head, but massive, the, 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 the biggest amount in my portfolio is always developers and this is no different. Yeah, I'm following uh, the story around uh, your company and Myriad Uranium, and it really sounds very exciting. But also you have another Neobium project yes. besides the, the project in Wyoming that you have uh, arrangement with uh, Myriad. How is that project? Is it, is it going uh, forward? Are you going forward with this project? Yeah, so that was the original 
uh, project that we had whenever we IPO'd. Yeah. Um, that was the main project. And, you know, w whenever you bring a company public, you need to have this main project and then you can also purchase other projects to be, you know, secondary. Yeah. It has to it has more to do with regulation than anything else. And the interesting thing uh, of that project is that it it seems like the the grades that we have found so far in smaller samples they're way too high for us to ignore. So even though we absolutely love you know the Copper Mountain project down in Wyoming and and we're working uh, with Myriad to advance that. When we look at you know the the Boxy project up in Quebec, we're actually on site right now. So our CEO is right now um, on site and he's working, you know, with uh, with a team up there. Uh, you know, you have showings of over 20 percent percent, 20 percent mineralization there. And you have really high grade niobium and you have really high grade uranium. Yeah. This is really the reason why this is really interesting to me is because I can't really put my finger on any other deposit around the world that is really high grade like this and really close to surface <laughs> because what we have is uh it's basically an intrusion so it's it's a dike right so it's almost like imagine you have a bowl of yogurt and you have like a chip that fell into the yogurt and mm -hmm. the chip is very different to the yogurt and so the the chip is uh we don't know how deep it is but, you know, we have an idea that, you know, it's it's a few kilometers long and everywhere that we grabbed along that chip is really high grade so far. Now, what we're going to do right now is we're going out there and we're drilling, you know, fairly shallow holes that you don't need a very special license to to operate. So we go in and drill, you know, seven to 10 meter deep holes because we want to understand, OK, is this really j yeah. just showing on the surface, surface or, or does, yeah. does that translate to, you know, a hole that's a few meters deep? Sure. And is is this just like really shallow um, or does it have any sort of length and, and depth to it? And so we're trying to get, you know, to a few different places and see, okay, can this produce something to the market and to us that shows that this has true potential? Uh, because I think that that if there's, you know, showings of, con you know, continuity along this dike, then we can go back to the market and say, like, look, we're getting grades that are world class mm -hmm. and it's right on surface and we can get to it. Now we need to know how deep this yeah. thing goes. Yeah. And so it's one of those things that like you can't really ignore something like that. And it's almost like it's low hanging fruit. Um, Niobium is is catching a bit. It's becoming more popular now. And so, you know, we have something in our hands uh, that I think is just too interesting to to pass on. Okay. Uh, yeah, news like coming to... soon. News coming soon because okay. we're we're on site right now. Okay. Uh, I would like to hear your take on the certain Iranian companies as well. Uh, I have a list here. Uh, one minute analysis on each. Uh, some pros and cons. Maybe uh, your opinion. Uh, let's start with the producers, uh, chemical. What's your take on chemical? Ah, that you got to love and hate chemical at the same time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think more, I think people should own it, uh, and keep it to a small part of their portfolio. Obviously this is not financial advice. Of course. But I like chemical because of how it's currently positioned. Um, not because they signed amazing contracts because yeah. We know that that's not true. Yeah, I like Cameco for the liquidity, so I'll I'll give them a thumbs up. Okay, uh, second on the list is Encore Energy. Encore Energy was my biggest uh, success story ever. I absolutely love it. Um, I don't own it anymore. Um, I am surprised it's catching a bid right now, and it's strengthening. So my question is, is there something happening, but, you know, behind the mm -hmm. scenes that we don't know about, or is this purely, uh, you know, the company has been able to advance it enough and, you know, become a producer from absolutely uh, nothing. Mm -hmm. um, 
but what's next for them? My question to Encore is what's next? Are you going on a bind spree? Are you just advancing the projects that you have? So I look at it on a positive side. I just don't know how much higher they can go, you know, without some massive steps. So take it with a grain of salt. Okay. Uh, what about UR energy? Your energy, I like. I think it's probably the... It's one of the least promoted companies Agreed. in the business. Yeah. And one of the most... Uh, conservative. Solid, conservative, no BS... Yeah. Uh, and all they wanted to do is wait for what's happening right now to come back and produce. Yeah, spot on. And I think I think that has partly hurt them historically. Yeah. I think that they could have raised money, you know, in better a condition. better way, better conditions if they were more promotional. They just showed the world who they really are and just, you know, decided to, I don't know, engage more with the investing community. I think, you know, especially over in Canada, I think they would have done better. Uh, but, you know, they're they're restarting their production, yeah. albeit with a few delays as with everybody in the business. Uh, I like them, but again, are, are they ever going to become a big enough story for them to really you know, enjoy this bull market or are they going to just maintain their conservative st stance on promoting and just never be as sexy as Encore Energy, right? Because you see the the way that the two companies have decided to to build out and it's completely different. But I think Encore is getting the, the, the better deal by just being out there, by just yeah. making sure that enough people know who you are and that you have a future and that you're going somewhere. And uh, I think your energy should do a bit more of that. Obviously, I'm biased. Like, I'm a promoter. So, <laughs> so don't ask me if a company should promote or not. But I, I take your energy seriously. It's a small company. But I take it seriously because they, they're all about producing and nothing more. Yeah. What about UEC, Uranium Energy Corp? So UEC is the opposite of that. Uh, very promotional company. It was the first uranium company that I ever bought in my portfolio way back in 2014. And I did well with it. Um, I haven't, you know, been a shareholder in a very long time. With UEC, what I, obviously I like uh, American-based companies. I think that in general, they're going to do very, very well in this cycle. And UEC has uh, not just the characteristics that they can raise money with a lot less dilution because, you know, they're, they're really good at the money game. Yeah. But also, Amir Nani, I don't know how he makes the deals that he does, but I don't know a better deal maker in this business. And so a project will sit there and everybody knows that a hundred million have been spent on it and he'll come in and buy it for like 2 million. <laughs> yeah. He did yes. it with, yeah, he did it not just with uranium. He did the same thing with his gold company, uh, gold mining. So oh. I, like, it's hard to argue against a guy yeah. that is able to create that kind of value. And yes, obviously he, he gets paid a pretty penny in order to do that, but he is the very active and you don't see his companies die. Like they, they, they don't die. They just always grow. There's always, there's always something happening. There's always the next step. There's always an acquisition. There's always, you know, they're going to come back and produce. And yeah. so yeah. I, I wouldn't expect UEC to bring me a ton of returns if I bought it now, you know, on a percentage basis. Yeah. But I, I I would consider it to be, you know, a pretty stable part of the portfolio of a developer that is like, okay, th this is going to go somewhere. And not only will they get lots of promotion in Canada where everybody knows them, but also when this thing really becomes more mainstream in the U.S. with investors, I think UEC is going to do really well. So Good point. Uh, let's move to developers. Uh, first one, Denison Mines. I really like Denison. Um, the you. big question with Denison is 
can can they really make ISR possible in the Athabasca Basin? If they can do it at scale, which is the big question, I, I think it's the only question that needs to be answered. I know that they've done it yes. um, and they've done it, you know, to a certain extent. I think what the market wants to see is, will Denison be able to, to do that at a level that makes them that much cheaper than the other players? Uh, I think that the way that they have kept many millions of pounds of uranium for so many years and have slowly, elegantly been selling it into the market for a very good profit is world-class management. I think that the companies that didn't do that um, are probably shooting themselves in the foot and not real believers of the thesis anyway. So good on them for doing that. absolutely love that they... Uh, were able to play play the cycle as good investors, right? I mean, when it, when your material is super cheap, go out, buy it in the market, um, just keep a lid on it, quite literally, and wait for it to appreciate, and then slowly, you know, liquidate that in order to use it for your capex. And so, I think it's brilliant how how they've done it. I wish more companies would do it. And yeah, Denison also large enough company that I think is going to be, you know, trick. I think the money is going to trickle down into companies like Denison. And so I quite like it. It, get, it gets two thumbs up for me. Okay. I would, I would not worry about putting Denison on like my mother's portfolio or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, what about Global Atomic? Uh, I own Global Atomic. Uh, Global Atomic is kind of the all or nothing play. Now, a piece of news just came out um, about, I think the the Minister of Mines in Niger visiting you know, the site, right. the, the DASA site, and being extremely positive about it, et cetera, et cetera. And everybody is, is spreading that as you know, obviously a positive. Uh, the issue with that project is obviously uncertainty and investors hate uncertainty. And so I think that the, the company has been really, really hurt because banks don't care if we believe that DAS is going to be developed. They want to make sure that, you know, their investment is safeguarded. And the current situation in Niger is very messy. Now, the government of Niger, the, the current, you know, transitioning government or whatever it's called currently, is, whether it gives it the green flag or not, I think is just one of the items that they need in order to make sure that they don't just get proper financing, but they get good financing. It, it goes back to, you know, your energy did, didn't get the best terms because they didn't promote enough so you you don't raise your prices to to get the best possible uh level of or the least possible level of dilution with global atomic they did everything right and then something completely outside of their control is making people question the it's not even whether dasa will produce or not it's whether the project is going to be as valuable as it could be because we have to remember the bottom line of investing is you have to buy low in order to sell high, but you have to sell high to somebody else who will pay higher than you. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it for a difficult thesis for, you know, the situation with the Russians coming in with the U S probably, probably exiting and having this weird, you know, no man's land situation. Okay. I I'm still holding. And I think that eventually things will you know, work themselves out, but I'm giving myself years for that situation to work itself out. Uh, for somebody coming in right now, it's like, okay, this is a basket case of a country with a really juicy project, good management team, you know, and they're advancing and they're likely going to produce, but who else is going to buy, yeah. you know, your shares next time? Uh, so it's a tough sell. And I'm holding, I haven't, I haven't sold a single share of uh, my global atomic position. And I've just had to extend my expectations, you know, timeline, um, time-wise. And I ju I'm just hoping because the uranium story is getting better and it's getting stronger, 
I think that is what's going to make up for the fact that I've had to, you know, push, push my expectation out for production, you know, maybe a couple more years. But if it weren't for that, then then I wouldn't be so positive on Global Atomic and through no fault of their own. Yeah, uh, same jurisdiction, a little bit different story, Govix Uranium. Uh, Govix is very, very difficult uh, because most people have admittedly bought into this and in, into the Govix story because of Maduela, uh, their Niger project. Uh, what I like about GoVX is that that's not their only project. So my focus uh, regarding GoVX is right now, they, they could lose their mining license in Niger because they haven't been able to, to advance it for obvious reasons. And it, it, if they lost that, I think it would be very, very bad. But at the same time, I don't think it's a zero. I think it's impossible for GoVX to be a zero uh, because they have other projects in other ju completely different jurisdictions that they are advancing currently. Yeah. yeah. So GoVX to me is the biggest contrarian play. Um, I would never say, you know, like sell your house and put your money into GoVX and just wait for it to, to moon. But it's an interesting bet that things are going to get better because it, it can get worse, but it can't get that much worse, <laughs> if you know yeah. what I mean, because we know what's in store, right? right? What What's at play here is that they might lose their main uh, project. Yeah. And so if you go back to their other projects and you calculate what you think they're worth and when they're going to be developed, you know, going into the future, et cetera, and if you think about that and you can come up with a decent valuation, yep. then you know where you stand, whether it's cheap or expensive. So it's hard to say uh, today because that's also like extremely volatile. I don't even know, you know, what they're being quoted for today. But Govex is one that it, it could be a really, really, really great bet if things are just bad and not horrible. Okay, what about next gen? Ah, next gen. I was just <laughs> joking uh, with a friend recently about uh, uh, their 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 choice of uh, luxury cars <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and, and how they how they pay themselves so hand, handsomely and, and you know we, we kind of wish we we would have made such a discovery and and been on that on the receiving end of that so. Yeah. Next gen is the richest, largest undevelopment, uh, sorry, uh, undeveloped, undeveloped uranium deposit in the world. That's undeniable. Extremely unlikely that anybody else is going to, you know, get to that stage anytime soon. <clears throat> Excuse me, because they made a, their discovery some 10 years ago and they've been able to, to advance it against the market, which is even more impressive. So, yeah, their their executives do deserve fair compensation. I think they're, they're you can make an argument that they're overly compensated to Definitely. the tunes of uh, millions per year. Uh, but next gen will catch a bit because we have to remember in the game of, of investing, at least in my point of view, in the game of investing, you're very rarely fairly valued. I can't find one company out there that I look at, you know, oh, here are your projects, here are your your NPVs. And we first of all, do we even believe the NPVs that that people are putting out? Yeah. And you know, your market cap is a brilliant reflect reflection of your NPVs plus minus cash debt, et cetera. And you know, this all works out to be a fairly valued company. It doesn't really work like that. They're either under or overshooting. So with next gen, it tends to overshoot because their resource is so rich. And the thing is, they are actually still finding more uranium very far from their deposit that is extremely high grade. So these guys can still manage to add value at a point where they don't really need to add value to the deposit. The question in everybody's mind is when do they start producing? And I'm not sure that really matters 
because when people are throwing their money at uranium to participate in the story uh, and you have exposure to the richest, you know, development play that is still exploring and finding extremely high grade, I think that they're going to overshoot and keep themselves in that higher band of, you know, overshot stocks. Um, so next gen is one that I've never owned. Um, I'm not interested in buying it because I'm not into sexy stocks. I'm into, you know, the stuff that might go bankrupt. <laughs> I, I like the stuff that is small or kind of dying and troubled. I like to take that risk personally, and I don't recommend it to most people, but you know, with next gen, if, if you own a bit in your portfolio, you're likely going to do very well because newcomers are going to come in and just bid the price up like it doesn't matter. Yeah. Fabi, what's your take on Enfield Energy? Ah, Enfield Energy, I used to own um, and I sold several years ago when I figured and a lot of a lot of people come to this conclusion with UEC as well or this opinion, it's not a conclusion, it's it's not black and white, it's just an opinion. Um, I thought that the, the management um, compensation was not commensurate with the size and development stage of the business back then. Maybe that has changed. Obviously, a lot of things have changed in the company that has have made it better. Um, but because I used to own it, you know, I just haven't looked at it in, in, in deep detail since. Um, I think that the mill is, you know, something that needs to be looked at and how much work does it actually need? And can you actually get it over the line? Like we have to remember for some, for some of these, and this, go, this is uh, just mining in general, for some of these projects, sometimes um, you have an asset that is supposed to be worth something in your books but your market cap is too small for you to be able to do anything with it. And so it comes down to, okay, how do we finance this? How do we advance it? And then you have, you run the risk of getting into too much debt and too large a debt for your market cap, or you just don't get it at all because bankers are smart, or you have to grow your market cap to a certain extent where, you know, like you're diluting yourself a lot in order to, to advance something. Having said this, I think that Corey did an amazing job at grabbing dirt cheap projects at the bottom of the market, just like the way Denison played the market. I think Corey did that. And so now I think that compensating him for doing that work isn't so bad, but at the time, I think it was a bit dear. So Enfield to me, um, I have to go back and take a second look, you know, uh, not just on the current assets, but, you know, is is the mill play valid and how much is that realistically going to take and what kind of pain are they going to have to go through in order to to advance that okay final developer then we will move to explorers uh, western uranium and vanadium i made a decent amount of money with western um western at the time had a how can I put this nicely? <laughs> it had a people problem mm -hmm. where the people involved in the company um, didn't really deliver the story that they were selling. And so that's why I got out because I don't mind a company that says to you, look, we're going to sit on these assets and we're not going to do anything and we're going to wait for the price to catch a better bid. That's completely fine. That's the reason why I bought Encore and, you know, made 15 times my money plus. With Western, it seems like they, they feel like they need to, to tell people that they're advancing the projects and they haven't been able to do that to the extent that they have promised. With that, I'm like, okay, not for me, because I know it takes a lot of raising money, dilution, et cetera, in order to do do anything in the mining business and so i would have preferred that they had a different stance because it's not that they don't have assets that are good it's quite the opposite it's just that you know the i think the the strategy should have been different for western 
And so again, with Anfield, and I invested in both at, kind of at the same time, way back when, and exited them because of that. Uh, but, you know, I, I love the Sunday Mind Complex, and it, it wouldn't be surprising to me to see that back up. Like I said, U.S. play and has worked before, will probably work again in this environment. Okay, uh, let's let's give it a try with Explorers. Uh, first on my list would be Forum Energy. Forum Energy, I'm very biased on because, uh, you know, they're a client. <laughs> I love the Thielen bases. I don't like how expensive it is. I love the fact that Atha Energy is coming in and investing a lot of money in the Thielen bases. And I think that it, it is one of those companies that have been around for a long time. And finally, they were able to find the right person, the right exploration mind yeah. to go in there and just do the, you know, the hardest work possible in order to try to delineate a proper deposit. Uh, the grades they're finding are excellent. And I think that we might see the beginning of the Thelon bases becoming, you know, like the next sexy thing after the Athabasca basin. Don't get me wrong. It's not like the Athabasca, Athabasca is going anywhere. I don't believe that. That's, you know, pre preposterous to, to even think about. Yeah. But I think that not enough people are looking at the Thelon basin and looking at just how similar that is geological, geologically to the Athabasca. And there aren't many players there. And so I think Forum has today the technical acumen to go in there and continue, you know, to make discoveries and, and not just sit on, you know, a couple of good holes. I, I think they're going to find a lot of great things. I really do, do believe that Rebecca Hunter is onto something and she really knows her stuff. That woman is uh, an encyclopedia of, of knowledge. So. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, you mentioned Atha Energy. What's your take on Atha? I love how Atha came out of nowhere as a big company. It was never a small, tiny, big company for us, you know, who play in, in, in very small companies. And, uh, and they came in with, you know, all the money in the world and all the assets and doing deals and, and this, that, and the other. And I think it's a great testament to how well, people are starting to look at the thesis, right? To, to be able to come up with a company that's so well formed right <laughs> from the start, it actually means that somebody out there cares about uranium and is willing to put their money where their mouth is. Uh, I like Atha more for the fact that it, because you know it, it started out so much bigger than the others, they have momentum. And so they were, were able to, you know, have a lot of cash from the beginning, um, buy a project. I think they're far from done on the M&A front. I think there's a lot of M&A in their future. Yeah. And I really like that the, you know, that they're so in love with the Thelon Basin. And I think that they're going to attract a lot of capital to, to that region. And so I'm very positive at that. I think it's one where, you know, soon enough, it's the money that's, starting to trickle down um will trickle down to them first and they're going to be able to leverage that into really good m a purchases so i i would not count them out and good yeah, management team solid people solid yeah. technical people as well i've i've met them they're, they're good people another company with great people uh cosa resources what's your take ah cosa so i really like cosa but i am being a bit cautious because and I don't know if this is strategy. It could be. I hope it is. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at current develop developments and current uh, exploration programs in the Athabasca Basin that are happening right now, and or have you know are wrapping up right now, and we're waiting on results. And COSA, if I'm not mistaken, has not reported anything yet, and uh, at least at the time of this recording. And something that I expected them to do is if they came up on any, you know, radioactivity levels, CPS readings, that they'd be putting that out and they didn't. Now, have they not done that because they haven't found anything yet? Or have they not done that because it's just a strategy and they 
are choosing not to put you know their their results out obviously winter a winter program is not the only thing that they're going to do and so whatever is there now is very preliminary you know I, i'd be looking for you know later in the year to really see what they've been able to produce but it kind of to me it raises a question mark because to me like they were the golden boys of this year for exploration in the athabasca basin and now i'm just kind of holding my breath waiting for something to come out and i have no idea if they're going to come out with an absolute blockbuster or if they're going to you know come up with hey we we found like graphite and you know something here or there but no actual uranium so big question mark but if they don't find anything in this winter program and they sell off i'd be looking to buy because you buy the people and not just you know one maiden drill program uh and and with cosa you get you know some of the best people in the business doing what they've done before in the same kind of region they've done it before so it's textbook you know uh recruit style of investing you know bet on people uh fabi what about standard uranium Ah, uh, standard uranium has suffered a lot because they they went through some of the worst years in the business and they have had you know just serious challenges in their exploration programs you know things just not working out for them in many operational fronts yeah which is sad uh <clears throat> and i think that the best thing that they could have done is what they have finally done which is you know become more of not just a, a sole exploration business but more of a project generator. I wish they they would have done it sooner. But at the same time I think the the biggest value for the investor with Standard was back when they were I think a 3.5 million dollar company and they announced that they were becoming a project generator. That was the time to buy Standard. The next time to buy standard I think will be when either them or one of their partners makes a massive discovery. Now it's a wait and see game really because I I think that uh if you miss that window then now it's a show and show and tell me show me not just tell me kind of uh play and I really like the guys behind it uh you know I've met with them several times but at the same time like you got to find something and sometimes it takes several years with forum you know it took a long time until they could get to this stage mm-hmm. and i think that the the stage uh, of standard right now is just okay where are they really going to hit it out of the park and then it, it the whole story turns on its head right when you make a true discovery in the athabasca basin it's usually very rich very high grade so i'm looking forward to that I have them few more uh F3 uranium. F3 is a former client um amazing discovery. I don't know to what extent they can grow that. That's still a question mark that's open. Um the thing with mm. F3 right now at this very moment is that there looks to be and I'm not I'm not a technical analysis kind of person but there seems to be like this hard ceiling on their price it, it just cannot pierce through right uh they've actually done a uh, decent financing i think with denison correct me if i'm wrong i can't remember i think with denison at a higher level than what they're yeah, trading right now yeah it's it's a le- it's a legitimate discovery extremely high grade uh by you know team wise um and technically it's hard to get better than what they have you know right now but at the same time if you're putting money into a company you have to ask yourself okay what is next for them and what is going to take this higher and i think that they need to just really find um more uranium which it, it, i i was actually having this conversation you know with the team a, a long time ago and i said look there's an there is this unwritten rule about discovery and about the markets and i don't know if you know this but this is a reality you have to find better intersects always at all times or else your price suffers yeah 
And it's idiotic to think about it because what matters in the end is can you extract it for more value than, than what it costs? But the expectation of the average investor is, is the next hole going to be better than the first? And it doesn't necessarily need to be. They just need to find more uranium and it needs to be, you know, at a, a, a depth and, and like situation where they can extract it for a decent profit. So I think that we have to align those expectations. But if they continue to find high grade uranium, then, you know, they, they can't take off just right now. They're finding this this really tough ceiling to break through. So we'll see. I'm excited for what more they can find and how much they can grow. The deposit. Sure. sure. What about Pegasus resources? Pegasus is probably one of the cheapest companies out there, considering uh, the fact that we know for a fact it's a very serious management team. Wasn't always the case. And I think that we can finally say that, you know, yeah. this is becoming more and more clear with each passing day. I love the fact they have a project in the US. I'm a fan of, you know, US based uranium projects. I think there are no brainers. And I think it's too cheap. It's, it's not going to continue to be like that. Um, Chris has really, you know, taken a, a very hands on uh, stands to his marketing. He's out there, he's available, he's open, yeah. he's doing the work. And he, I think will, will be one of the great winners of, you know, this bull market because he's going from, you know, a tiny restructured company that is taken on assets that can actually put them on the map. So I'm, I'm very hopeful. And remember with such a small market cap, you know, uh, we're talking just a few million dollars. You can sneeze and accidentally triple your money. Yeah. Like at a certain point in the market, there is no difference between a $15 million market cap and a $5 million market cap. People lose their perception of value whenever you know they're in a bull market. And so that plus the fact that it's an actual, you know, team trying to to build something special, uh, it makes makes it a no brainer. I'm a, I'm a holder of Pegasus for sure. Uh, what about Sky Harbor? Sky Harbor is a client of mine. Uh, so I really, really like Sky Harbor. I have no idea how they have stood the test of time for so long because they've been around for, I think, over a decade now. Yes. And yes. they've been able to endure the worst market we have ever seen. Uh, but let's face it, they're project generators. So they were able to do it because that's just a better business model if you want to survive. Um, I am extremely excited by Russell and more, you know, they're two uh, flagship projects. Uh, not as excited about their other projects because, you know, they're, they're being vended out, but you never know. They, they have so many deals with so many other companies that you could get something, you know, like really, really out of left field with one of their partners. That's a possibility, which costs them nothing, puts money in the bank for them, which is a great deal. But Russell and Lake, I'm very, very excited about. I'm excited about the fact that they're so close to, you know, Denison's projects. And I love the Denison connection within Sky Harbor. I think that's a great testament of the, the quality of the team. So Sky Harbor is one of those companies that if you want to get exposure to the Athabasca Basin and you don't want to nitpick, you know, that is one of the companies that you, you can just get exposure to many different projects by buying into one. So definitely want to watch at the very least. Final one, base load. Ah, base load. Uh, base load, sometimes I wonder if they have the right technical team, but the wrong or the the imperfect financial structure or you know, like stock structure because the selling pressure on baseload doesn't match i believe the technical advancements and knowledge of the team so what you see here is in my opinion and i i don't know if it's gotten any better in in the last you know 6 months or so but the last time I looked at, at base, base load, it's like, okay, you guys are, you're getting somewhere. And then your stock keep, 
keeps getting sold off. It's it, there's a disconnect there. So sometimes it goes back to okay, who owns the stock? Who is trying to get out? You know, it, those questions they need to be answered. Unfortunately, that's part of the business. It's not just about what can you find. It's the supply demand story needs to translate to your particular stock. And so if there's too much of the stock, you know, out in the market, then the price goes down, even if the story is getting better. So it's an unfortunate thing, you know, that they have suffered so much price wise compared to, you know, all the work that, that they've been doing in the, in the last few years. So has that changed my, I think my, my question would be how deep can you dig into the people doing the buying and the selling of this company? And do you consider that, you know, uh, in the past versus what's coming in the future? Because I think that so, something similar could have been said about Pegasus, you know, about people that were selling the, the stock too cheaply and kind of destroying the company. Yeah. And if you can pinpoint and say, okay, that has changed, then, you know, technically I think baseload has a lot to go. Probably two more questions and then, then I will let you go. Uh, are there any Iranian companies that are on your radar now to buy them for the first time? I mean, not the positions you already hold, but some potential Iranian companies to buy for the first time. To buy for the first time, yeah. mm, probably not. Um, I know that there, there are a few companies, you know, coming around and and there there will be a couple of really interesting ones but the what i see happening right now is too too many companies that take the you know the pure play exploration route that are way too risky you know maybe they ipo'd at a premium and you know i can't make a case for them yet because they're not solid enough and for me, like I said, I love the development story. I love US-based, you know, uranium plays and, and things of that nature. So to me, the, you know, what I like is really what I already own. Uh, but as soon as I say that, I'm, I'm sure that there's a company like being created right now that's going to come out and, and do really, really well. So it, it's whether people want to take that exploration risk. Okay, final question, Fabio. What other commodities are you bullish in the short term? Besides, I would, I would say gold. Um, I really like gold developers right now. It's hard for me to find one that isn't cheap compared to not just the current price of gold, but a decent long term price of gold. I think the market needs to up its expectations of what the price of gold will be in the future. Look, the price of gold has gone up quite a bit for us because we've seen the price flat for years. And so for us to see any sort of movement up, now it's it's a matter of going back to the producers and thinking, okay, the producers have gotten much better, you know, if you look from a, a balance sheet perspective. I get that. That's great. But it's not like they're gushing cash. The old adage of, hey, you know, like this business is a gold mine. It actually backs fire nowadays. A gold mine doesn't always make money whatsoever nowadays. It's not a done deal. It's not so obvious. And so you kind of have to ask yourself, is it because the whole industry is that bad? Or is it just because the cost of producing gold <laughs> has gone up to such an extent that, you know, we have to be more realistic about the future price? And I think it's it's a little bit of the latter too. I think we have to recognize that the price of gold will have to remain high uh, for it to get produced to the levels that that it you know they're being produced uh, right now. So yeah, gold to me has that gap of catching up. A lot of companies are starting to get a bid now, but this this has been something that I've I've been talking about quite a bit. Look at the gold developers; they're cheap. They're not going to stay cheap forever. These things are cyclical. They go back in vogue and they're going to be sexy again, hopefully soon. 